Mesdames et messieurs, ça commence. Ven, venez tout de suite. We're starting. No, just the speaker right now. Donc, Cara et... Euh, voilà. Si tu veux, tu peux le présenter en français. Ah. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Stephen Wise, who is the founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project. He's practiced animal protection law for 30 years throughout the U.S. and teaches animal law at five different universities, including Harvard University. The legal efforts of Mr. Wise and the Non-Human Rights Project were the subject of the 2016 documentary, Unlocking the Cage, relating to uh, the habeas corpus remedy for wrongful imprisonment uh, of chimpanzees. So join me in welcoming Mr. Wise. Thank, there, excellent. Thank you very much for introducing me. I do not teach at Harvard right now. Harvard would want me to tell you that. <laughs> Instead, last year I taught at Stanford, so there. Well, in 2013, uh, the Non-Human Rights Project uh, filed um, a series of three lawsuits in the first week of December of that year. And we filed um, common law, or, or we sought common law writs of habeas corpus on behalf of chimpanzees in, in the state of New York. And what I want to do is tell you uh, what led up to that, the what sort of, of decisions we had to make that, that would, would lead to that, because none of them were inevitable, and uh, how we filed the lawsuits, what, what the lawsuits were about, and uh, how the judges have responded to our lawsuits, and how we've responded to the judges. And, then, uh, and, and since then, we've moved into um, uh, filing lawsuits in, um, on behalf of elephants in Connecticut, and uh, we'll be moving into filing lawsuits likely in California um, as well, and I'll, if I have time, I'll I'll talk to you about those as well. So this began uh, when, when at, at a time when I was president of the Animal Legal Defense Fund for 10 years, actually from 1985 to 1995. And I'd, I'd gotten involved with them actually even before that. And by 1985, um, David Favor, uh, uh, who was a, a professor of law in, in the United States, and I had come to the conclusion that there was no way that we could ever adequately protect the interests of any non-human animals uh, because uh, the, there is a serious structural defect in that they were all understood to be legal things. And a legal thing is an entity who lacks the capacity for any kind of legal right, as opposed to a legal person who has the capacity for one uh, or a hundred or an infinite number of legal rights. And so I began to envision uh, this, this legal wall that existed. And on one side of the wall are legal things, and the other side are legal persons. So on the thing side of the wall, and, and it, it's been this since Roman times, so quite a long time. So if you're a legal thing, you lack the capacity for rights, you're invisible to civil law, uh, your interests don't count, uh, you're not seen as having any kind of inherent value, but the only value you have, as far as the law understands, is instrumental value. In other words, what your value is to legal persons. And for the entire time in which there have been legal things, non-human animals, all non-human animals, have been legal things. Now, one thing we try to remind judges when we go into court is what I'm telling you now about the dichotomy between legal things and legal persons. Um, and the reason we need to go into that is that we want to make sure that judges do not make the error that they may frequently make, which is believing that legal persons and humans are synonyms for each other. So that all humans are legal persons and all legal persons are humans. Um, many judges, for whatever reason, either believe that rationally or they, or they feel it. So that's why we try to begin to explain the, the difference between legal things and legal persons. So uh, the reason I started talking about that was 
not only have all non-human animals been legal things throughout legal history, but for most of legal history, there were millions and millions of human beings who were also legal things. Slaves were legal things. Uh, sometimes women might be, or children might be, or other kinds of human beings would be legal things. And they would be treated just like non-human animals, or just like the microphone, or like an inanimate object. So on the other side of that wall, then, are the legal persons. So <clears throat> there's never been a non-human animal, or there hadn't been non-human animals on that, on that person side of the wall. And there's always been human beings there. But there, was, there, there weren't all human beings there until relatively recently, within the last 150 years, where eventually all humans were. And so a lot of, this, of the civil rights work of the last centuries has been to move all of the legal things who are human beings through that wall over to the sides of to the side of being a legal person. And so today in 2018, all non-human animals are legal things and all humans are legal persons. When we tried, so it, it, if you don't understand the history of it, you might think that that was always so. But what we try to explain, which what I'm explaining now, is that what this is is really a process, that at any one time, who's a person or who's a thing is really just a snapshot of what's going on then. And so right now you have a snapshot, which all humans on this side of the wall are indeed legal persons, all non-humans on the other side are not, but it's a process. And now what the Non-Human Rights Project is, is coming into court and continuing that process. It's now time to move some, at least, of the non-human animals from the thing side of the wall over to the person side of the wall. Then we also point out to the, the judges that there are many, and there always have been, uh, many non-human entities on the person side of the wall. So they'll be uh, familiar with uh, uh, corporations or legal persons, or ships are legal persons, or <clears throat> likely within the Canadian system, probably the city of Montreal is for some, pur some purpose a legal person, or even the country of Canada is a legal person. But probably closer to what what I'm talking about now is, for example, in, um, in uh, New Zealand. Uh, for the last few years, or I think two years ago, uh, the Wanganui River was made a legal person. And when I say they're legal persons, I, I mean that they have, they have various rights and they can have various kinds of, of duties or responsibilities uh, as well, or it, not they, it, the river. Uh, last year, a national park in New Zealand was was designated a legal person. Uh, in I think in I think in March the Colombian or the April the Colombian Supreme Court designated the Amazon rainforest as a legal person. And in India, uh, in colonial English days, uh, a Hindu idol was designated a legal person. A, a mosque uh, in two thousand, the Indian Supreme Court designated uh, the holy books of the Sikh religion a legal person. And very much to the point, in 2014, the Indian Supreme Court held that all animals, all non-human animals in India, all of them uh, had rights for legal persons, both under statutes and under the Indian constitution. And there's also a, uh, a chimpanzee named Cecilia in Argentina who, has been, who uh, was the subject of a habeas corpus action. The judge found that Cecilia was a non-human person, issued the writ of habeas corpus, ordered her freed uh, to a, a sanctuary in Brazil. And there's a case now in front of the Colombian Supreme Court uh, where a, uh, a speckled bear named Chucho uh, was, the, the, was the subject of a writ of habeas corpus in, the, in that country. And uh, she, the uh, Chucho lost at the first level, won at the sub second level, lost at the third level, and it's in the fourth level. So, I, frankly, I don't know how many levels there are in Colombia, um, but they're at the fourth, fourth level now. So the reason we try to explain these things to the judge is so that they understand that who is a person and who is a thing is not never has been and never will be an issue of biology. What it is, it's, an, it's a matter of public policy and moral principle. 
in that it, it, it's the way that judges would think about anything fundamental uh, respecting human beings, the interests of human beings. You look at public policy, you look at moral principle. You want to do either what's right or what's good, or if you're, if you're lucky, what's both good and right. So in 1985, uh, nobody was thinking like this. And so uh, David Favor and I realized that there was a serious problem that non-human animals were all seen as legal things and that litigating, you're essentially litigating on, on behalf of slaves. And it's, it's impossible to get anywhere. Uh, in fact, uh, the only place you can get are the places where the masters, the legal persons, have decided to allow the slaves, the, the things, to, to be. What, or they'll give them protections. They'll give them welfare. They won't give them rights. And sometimes I have people come up to me and say, well, why don't you not try to get legal rights for non-human animals? Why don't you just try to get better welfare protections or better uh, animal protections? And I say, well, why tell you what, why don't you give up all of your rights? And then what we'll do is we'll pass a statute saying that uh, you ought to be protected. Uh, people can't be cruel to you. And if they are, there's nothing that you can do about it. But you might go and petition the Crown to bring a criminal prosecution. And if they do, it doesn't really involve you. Hey, is that a deal? So, so far, no one's ever taken me up on that. And the reason they wouldn't take me up on that is because it's a, not a good deal at all because you understand that you're not protected in any serious way at all. And that's why no matter what kind of protections, no matter what kind of you know, either welfare, animal welfare, animal protection, it's never going to be worth very much unless they are rights, unless you have moved uh, the entity, whatever that entity is, from the category of thing to the category of person. So David Favor and I soon began to understand that, although the understanding I have now in 2018 is, is I tell you, much more sophisticated than it was in 1985. Then we were just saying, this is a hell of a mess. You know, how do we, how do we begin to, to fix it? Uh, and so at that time in 1985, I decided that, um, I would, that that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And I figured then that it would take about 30 years before we were ready, we were ready to file the first lawsuit. And um, it, I was unduly pessimistic. It only took 28. Now, why? Well, in 1985, I wouldn't have been standing up here talking to you. Nobody cared about what I was talking about. I was pretty sure I was going to live and die in absolute anonymity. And nobody is more surprised than I am that... While I'm going to die, it's not going to be an anonymity. Uh, there are many people now around the world who know what I do and know what the Non-Human Rights Project does. But at that time, there were no law school classes. I, I don't know if there are, I, I doubt there are any undergraduate classes. There were no textbooks. There were no law books. Uh, there were no law school classes. Uh, people really just didn't talk about it. There certainly weren't, weren't, weren't any lawsuits. And so <laughs> we realized uh, you know, what we're going to have to do. So one of the things was to try to begin teaching these kinds of, you know, the, these kinds of classes. So in 1985, I was living in Boston. I sent a, a letter out to all, I think, seven law schools in Boston saying, I want to teach a class in animal rights law. So when like six months passed and I, no one answered, I figured that the answer was no. And it was five years later before the Vermont Law School has actually asked me to come and teach the first class in animal rights law, which I think may have been the second overall class in, in the world. Uh, and so I began doing that. And I, and I would do that for the next 25 summers. Uh, so even when I was invited to teach the first class at Harvard Law School in, in 2000, there were still just a handful of law school classes uh, on animal issues at all. I, I teach a class called Animal Rights Jurisprudence. I don't believe anyone else in the United States does. Uh, they, teach, they teach usually animal protection law, animal welfare law, uh, but sometimes they'll start throwing in some of the cases 
and I'm, I'm sure really happy to see that the Non-Human Rights Project is doing and that other, uh, other uh, folks are doing in, in other places. Uh, and now I think the United States may have 140 uh, law school classes that deal with animals or you know, animal law, animal protection, and my animal rights jurisprudence. So that is a huge difference. Another thing is there weren't any books about it. And so what I first began doing um, in 1990 was, begin, was uh, I thought I would start writing law review articles. Are, are there law students here? Okay, law, so law review articles are, are the journals that, for some strange reason, uh, law students are the gatekeepers for the scholarly literature in the legal profession, at least in, in the U.S., through law review articles. So there weren't any. So I began writing them and trying to get them published in law reviews. And, and I did, uh, including a massive one. Uh, however, by the middle of the 1990s, uh, I realized that not even my mother was reading my law review articles. So that nobody was reading them at all. That was not the way in which I could begin to communicate with my profession about what I wanted to do. So I said, okay, I'm going to start trying to write trade books. And I was able to find a woman named Mer Merloyd Lawrence, who um, is a very well-known editor, who, is, who had learned of me. It was, and when I came to her, she was interested in my work and helped me figure out how to begin to get trade books published. And she's been my editor now for 18 years, or 20 years, and I've, I've published four books, including in 2000, simultaneously with my beginning to teach at Harvard, rattling the cage toward le legal rights for animals. So. That's kind of the second thing I checked off. There was, we're now teaching, uh, you know, I was publishing books, law review articles, and other people were beginning to publish law review articles um, as well. Uh, so then there had, I, I realized that, that what we were doing um, was massive. It required a great deal. It's gonna be a huge social change, perhaps the largest uh, social change that had ever been asked of, of human beings. So I realized that I could not do that myself. There had to be an organization. So in 1996, I founded what was called for a long time the Center for the Expansion of Fundamental Rights, which as one of its projects had was the Non-Human Rights Project. And eventually the Non-Human Rights Project swallowed up the whole organization and we just simply changed the name of the organization to the Non-Human Rights Project. And in 2007, I sent an email out to a lot of people saying, I've been doing this for 22 years. I've now theorized the hell out of everything I'm gonna theorize. I'm, I'm finished, I've written, I've now written like 22 law review articles. I've written four books, you know, I've been teaching, I've taught at Stanford, now I, I, I taught, I've taught at like, I don't, I don't know, seven or eight law schools, both in the United States and in Barcelona. And uh, it's now time to start litigating this and see what the difference is between the ideas that I've been coming up with, you know, in my head around how we might be able to accomplish this and, and how real live judges and, and others are going to respond to it. So <laughs> as I went around teaching, I would say, anybody want to, you know, volunteer their time to, to work with me? And lots and lots of people did. So that by 2010, 2011, I was actually supervising 70, 70, 70 people remotely uh, until I was about to go start raving mad as they began to write memos. I, had, I, I, I was trying to figure out, for one thing, where are we going to file these suits? What kind of cause of action are, are we going to have? What non-human animals are going to be our plaintiffs? You know, where, where are they? So, so I began to bring people in who, who began to help me try to understand how, how to do that. So the, let's look at, at the first, first decision, or one of the early ones I made, which you can see in Rattling the Cage, probably. So we sued under the common law. So for those of you who are not lawyers, or who are lawyers, or law students, but can't remember what the common law is, uh, the common law is essentially the law that judges make while they're in the process of deciding cases that don't involve an interpretation of something that somebody else has written. So they're not interpreting a statute, they're not interpreting a treaty, they're not interpreting a constitution. What they're doing is they are making law. So unlike civil law judges, say in France, who tend not to actually make law, in fact, sometimes when I, when I speak, and in fact, I'll be in Paris soon, sometimes when I speak to civil lawyers, 
they can't believe that common law judges actually make law. Because in France, they, they, the judges don't make law, they interpret the law that the, the parliament makes. But I say, yes, under certain, many circumstances, the judges, the common law judges make law. For example, uh, at least in, in the United States, the idea of, of uh, a breach of contract, uh, the, what, what, goes, what makes a contract? How do you know when you breach the contract? What kind of remedies do you have? That's all common law, and it's not, it, it wasn't, it's, it's not made by statutes. Same thing if I walk outside and somebody runs me down in their car and I sue for negligence, that's usually not a statute, it's just something that the judges have come away with, have, have created over, over the centuries. So we wanted to bring suit under the common law for this reason, that the legal thinghood of non-human animals is ancient, and it's a common law legal thinghood. There's no statutes in the United States that say non-human animals are things. Uh, there may be in a civil law, there may be in, in this province, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, there isn't in, in any place that I know of in, in the United States. So we wanted to go in front of a judge and say, judge, you, meaning not meaning you, judge specifically, but your predecessors, your predecessor uh, judges in that jurisdiction, say the state of New York, or any state, that you are the ones who said that non-human animals, all non-human animals are legal things who lack the capacity for rights. Therefore, you can change it, and we're going to give you reasons why they should. And remember, Judge, it's that it's not a matter of biology, it's a matter of public policy and moral principle as to whether or not we should be able to persuade you to make that change. And we're prepared to do that. So, on the other hand, if you file a, a lawsuit in under a statute or under a, a constitution or under a treaty, for example, there might be a statute that says um, a person has a right to do X. And so we would then file a lawsuit in court and say, uh, we're suing under the statute and we're saying that the chimpanzees are, are persons within the meaning of the statute. What's probably gonna happen is that the judge is gonna look at that statute and then look to the legislative history. What did that legislature mean when they said person, and they're not going to say they meant my client, who's a chimpanzee, or an orca, or, or an elephant. Same thing if I tried to file suit under the Constitution, uh, and where they would give a person you know, certain kinds of rights, almost certainly they're going to look at, at the uh, history behind that, and they're going to say nobody ever intended to do that. So we decided we're not filing under a statute or the Constitution or treaty. We're going to file suit under the common law. Which is, which is confined essentially to English speaking countries. That's number one. Then what kind of, what cause of action are we going to bring? Like, like breach of contract is a cause of action or negligence is a cause of action. So when you go into a court, you're there, the judge and everyone understands that that there are, kind of, there are little legal boxes everywhere. And in order to get into court, you have to like check off the right boxes. So you, you have, there has to be a category that you're suing under. You just can't say, I want to go into court because I, 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 I was wronged. They'll say, well, what was the wrong? And they're, they're saying, in other words, what box am I checking off? Were your civil rights violated? Uh, you know, was there a breach of contract? Was, was there a tort committed against you? Uh, you know, did someone not pay their rent? Something like that. So we decided to use the, the, the writ of habeas corpus, actually the common law writ of habeas corpus. Now that came from, if you, if you look at um, Rattling the Cage, uh, I, for about a half a page, I talked about the famous slave case of Somerset versus Stewart, which were from 1772, where Lord Mansfield, who was Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench, he, in this extraordinary de decision, freed James Somerset and said that, uh, that, the, that slavery, he was referring to human slavery, was so odious. And when I'm, when I'm speaking to a country that, that doesn't understand English and I have a translator, I try to make the translator understand how bad you have to be to be odious. It's really super bad to do something that's odious. So he said that slavery was so odious that the common law would not support it and he freed James Somerset. And later on, um, later on, I would write an entire book about it called Though the Heavens May Fall, which uh, I'll get to in just a second. So right after that, or, or af 
right after I'd written it, when, when Rattling the Cage came out, uh, I did a book tour, lots of places. One of them, just I spent 10 days just doing BBC studios in London. And so while I was there, I went to Westminster Abbey. And, uh, and then I went to Poet's Corner. And there behind some construction, uh, which I pushed aside, was a wall plaque in Poet's Corner to Granville Sharp, who I had mentioned in Rattling the Cage. And he's known as the first abolitionist. And there, there they talked about one of the things that he was known for was, was that he was one of the brains behind this, the famous Somerset case. So then I started thinking about it more. So I decided to take that paragraph in Rattling the Cage, or the, or the half a page, and turn it into an entire book. And the purpose was to try to understand how it was that James Somerset's lawyers in 1772 were able to turn James Somerset from a person, from a thing into a person. In the United States, it took 750,000 dead people in, in, a, in, in a civil war basically to turn black slaves from things into persons. And England had done it through a lawsuit. So that really caught my attention. So I wanted to try to understand. I spent three years trying to understand all, what were the influences on Lord Mansfield? How is Granville Sharp involved? Uh, what did, um, you know, how did this work out with James Somerset? Who were the, what, what kind of legal arguments were brought in? What was going on in, in generally in the culture? Uh, so I could, model the litigation that I knew was coming on that litigation. And that's exactly what we do. So I, I, I um, wrote that book, I'm happy to say. It was uh, featured on the cover, the Sunday New York Times Magazine, which was terrific. My editor loved it. And actually now I have a, uh, uh, there may be a film uh, made of it uh, as well, which is which would be terrific because I want people to, I want the film to come out and I want people to ask me why I wrote the book, and then I'll tell them. I kind of like James Somerset, but here's why I really wrote the book, because, it, it, because I wanted to show how a non-human animal could also begin to show that her slavery was so odious that the common law should not support uh, that, at, you know, her slavery uh, as well. And one of the interesting things that happened that I related in the book, um, which is, um, it's a very exciting book, I just want to warn you. So you have the moment when James Somerset has escaped and he has had a confrontation with his, with his master. His master had purchased him at the, when he was seven years old, eight years old, and now he was almost 30. So they had a lot of time together and they had done a lot of things together up and down the coast of the United States. Now they're in London and he decides that he's going to be free. And there was some confrontation that occurred between him and his master and then he dropped from sight into London, which was this teeming mass and the largest city in the world in, in, in 1771. And Charles Stewart, his master, was so angry at what occurred that he hired slave catchers to find James Somerset. And when they found him, they were not to bring him back, but they were to put him on a ship, the Ann and Mary, that was anchored in London Harbor and sail him to Jamaica, where he was to be sold in the slave markets. And then he would harvest sugarcane for the three to five years that a black slave was able to do that before he died. So the slave catchers, it took them two and a half months and, but, and they found James Somerset. And they then chained him to the deck of the, of the Anna Mary. But before it could sail, somebody, and it may have been his godparents, but the English judicial system in its wisdom in 19, I think 1905, decided to house clean and they threw out the original habeas corpus petition. And so I, I, I was never able to find out for sure, but it may have been his godparents. And they go to Lord Mansfield and they ask that he issue a writ of habeas corpus. Now, habeas corpus cannot be issued on behalf of a thing, only on behalf of a person. So one of the really great things about Lord Mansfield was that he could have gotten rid of this case. And he had been dealing with people filing suits on behalf of slaves, not challenging their actual thinghood, but kind of biting around the edges. And in fact, I found a, a case that he had done that morning where he'd just gotten rid of the last case involving a black slave and was in a really, really bad mood about it. You could see, you could see how bad he was from the, from, from the transcript I, I, I found. And it was, of all days, it was then that late afternoon 
somebody, maybe his godparents, comes into him and says, I want to issue a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of James Somerset. Now, so Lord Mansfield could have said no, and in the American South, for the, up until the time of the Civil War, every single time that a, that a slave tried to do that, the, the, the courts would say no, because you're in a circle. You go and you say, I want to be free. I, I want, I'm not a thing, I'm a person. I want to ish, have, issue a writ of, have you issue a writ of habeas corpus. And the judge would say, well, no, you're a thing. He'd say, no, I'm a, I want to be a person. He said, well, per, well, thing, you're a thing now, and so things can't, so you're in, invisible to the court. You can't file a lawsuit, you're a thing. And the, the slave would say, but I'm a person. They say, well, you can't, I'm not even gonna hear you tell me you're a person because you're a thing. So I've now done that many times. So, and every time I walk into a courtroom trying to persuade a judge that our chimpanzee or eventually our elephants um, he ought to be the subject of a writ of habeas corpus. I, I, I know exactly how you know, whoever went in on behalf of James Somerset felt, and I can understand what the what's going on in, in, in the mind of the judge. So I feel like I recreate that scene, you know, time and time and time again. So there were there were several things about writs of habeas corpus that made them really attractive to be used as as, as a as a legal cause of action. So one of them is, is they're called their summary writs, which means they go really fast, really fast. Uh, the one we have in Connecticut now on behalf of elephants isn't going as fast as we want, but the ones in New York that we are doing, they only if you think 10 minutes is fast, then they went fast. So in New York, you walk in to court, and you say to the judge, issue a writ of habeas corpus. If he says no, then the case is over. He says yes, then he did it, and then you, and then later on you'll have a trial. So every time we went in, as you'll see, they they would say no. So all our cases were over in like you know ten minutes, a half hour, an hour, uh, which is what we were looking for, because we believe that after two thousand years of all non-human animals being a legal thing, the odds of a judge saying, you know, we've been wrong for these two thousand years. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. I'm going to issue the writ of habeas corpus. So we thought that that was extraordinarily unlikely, and we've not been di disappointed in that. So the judges would say, "No, we're not. I'm not. I'm not going to do it." So rather than get involved in litigation and discovery and have it take two years or three years or four years for us to lose, and before we can get up to the appellate courts, we wanted to lose in immediately, and then we could begin the journey up to the appellate courts. So that was one reason. Another reason is that there's something, there's, there's something called res judicata, which means the thing has been settled. So if, if you, I think that you breached a contract and I sue you for that and I lose, I can't just say, well, now I'm going to sue you again. In fact, I'm going to keep suing you until I win. The second time you do it, the other side will put in the defense of res judicata. The thing's already been settled and your case will be thrown out. So res judicata generally does not apply to habeas corpus cases. Um, sometimes the courts will, will say, um, you know, you're going to have to persuade us, you know, in, in, in a better way, or, or they, they each have their different rules in all of the, each of the 50 states. But it's pretty clear that, that you're not automatically thrown out, that there is no res judicata. Uh, the third thing is that they're, they're seen as protecting bodily liberty. And, and judges are extraordinarily protective of the body, the body liberty, at least they have been, of human beings. And so they're going to um, issue you know, formal procedures and formal kinds of defenses. They, they want to know, is somebody being essentially enslaved? Is someone being kept against her will? And so you know, we want to know about it, and we want to do, we want to do something about it you know, right now. So we thought that that would lessen the chances of having kind of formal defenses or formal procedures come in you know, to harass us. Uh, so there are other reasons why, why habeas corpus was, was, was good. Um, and when you looked at all the possibilities, we decided, then, we decided on habeas corpus. So you have a common law writ of habeas corpus. Now, habeas corpus means that uh, someone who is being detained against their will ought to be released. Now, we understood that we were going to have to give the judge a, a judge's reasons why 
the chimpanzee should be a person or why the chimpanzee should be released. So what we did, and I talked a little bit about it today, is that before we go into a jurisdiction, we study the judicial decisions. We read hundreds and hundreds of judicial decisions trying to understand what are the values and principles that the judges hold the dearest in that jurisdiction. And then we will uh, frame our arguments as to why a, a non-human animal ought to be a legal person with the right to bodily liberty protected by a common law writ of habeas corpus in precisely in those values and, and principles. And so we think over the long run, one of three things are gonna ha has to happen, in fact, every time. One of them is they say, uh, you're wrong, we actually don't believe in that principle. And we'd say, well, you know, tell us what that is, and then we'll file another lawsuit, and we'll invoke that principle. The second thing is they'll say, you're right, you win. The third thing is they'll say, we do believe in that principle, but uh, we're gonna, but we're not gonna issue the writ of habeas corpus. We're gonna, we're gonna arbitrarily put up some kind of a distinction uh, that will leave you out of it. And we understood that that was a likely thing to happen, but we also feel in the long run, since it is irrational and it's also arbitrary and, and unjust, that in the long run, it will not be stable. It's a way of getting rid of us now, but in the long run, it will, it will be overturned because it's, it, because it's irrational, arbitrary, and unjust. So we, we um, bring our lawsuit then in, in those terms. So in New York, we saw that all of the judges were in favor of liberty and equality, which is probably no surprise. So liberty is, is, <clears throat> is, a, is a kind of a liberty right because there's liberty, I think uh, Isaiah Berlin said, had 200, uh, thank you, I appreciate that, had 200 senses. So liberty, uh, in the sense we want, it means it's a right that you're entitled to because of who you are. While equality right is the kind of right you're entitled to because you're like somebody else in, in a relevant way. They also care a lot about autonomy. They, they, they saw it as their business to protect the autonomy of human beings. So we then went out looking for, now I can talk about why we picked chimpanzees, we went out looking for those non-human animals that we thought were the, would present the strongest case for autonomy. So we brought in, we got affidavits from, from the, you know, the greatest chimpanzee cognition experts in Japan, in Sweden, in Germany, in Scotland, in England, in the United States, all showing that chimpanzees are autonomous. That was really the purpose of, of them. Uh, so, have I hit? That's a, oh, so that's why we hit chimpanzees. A similar, that's why we're, we sue on behalf of elephants and we're moving, gonna be moving on behalf of orcas too. We believe we ha our strongest case right now uh, are, are with autonomous um, non-human animals, though we always argue that autonomy is a sufficient condition for rights, that is, any autonomous being of any species should, have, should, have, should, should be a person with certain kinds of rights that protect their autonomy, but we never argue that it's a necessary condition, that the non-human animals who are not autonomous are never entitled to have rights or, or be, be persons. So we, start, we then uh, identify uh, all the chimpanzees in the state of New York, and we simultaneously then, in December 2013, uh, begin filing lawsuits. So, <coughs> Wish I had another three hours, but I don't. So uh, I'll just s explain to you kind of the highlights and of what happened in the state of New York. And things are still happening in the state of New York. So we, w the, New York has a whole bunch of trial courts, and then it, it's divided geographically into four departments called the first, second, third, and fourth departments. And those are the intermediate appellate courts, and those funneled into a high court called the Court of Appeals. So we end up in filing lawsuits that take us to um, each of the four departments because once we lose, we, 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 we like file lawsuits again. So I think we filed two lawsuits on behalf of each of our chimpanzee clients. And that's when things really got strange. So the first time that we went to an intermediate appellate court, we were thrown out uh, almost the day that we filed our appeal uh, without being, that, because the, the, the court said, we've decided on our own, sua sponte, that you don't have a right to appeal. 
and we knew we did have a right to appeal, and we thought, boy, this is gonna be a rougher ride than, than we thought, we decided not to spend the next year or two appealing that, but to, that we would refile it, that lawsuit um, in, in maybe perhaps a more favorable place. It'd be hard to find a less favorable place, so uh, we, you know, we couldn't do worse. The next, th that was the second department. In the third department, we filed suit, on, on, we, we, they, they hear the appeal of the chimpanzee named Tommy. And we lose in that case on the grounds that only an entity who can assume duties that along with their responsibilities, they say, can, can be a person, which no English speaking court in the history of the world had ever conditioned anyone's rights on their ability to, to have duties. Um, one of the things that they relied upon was Black's Law Di Dictionary. I don't know if you have that in Canada. So we said, get out of here. So we, we went, we looked at Blacks, and sure enough, they cited Salmon on Jurisprudence, the 10th edition from, I think, 1929, that seemed to say that. And we said, well, that's crazy, because that hasn't happened before. So we couldn't find, it took us a long time to find it. We finally found it in the Library of Congress, and we found Salmon's. We realized that it actually said rights or duties, not rights and duties. So we wrote to the editor-in-chief of Blacks, and we said, you're really screwing up our litigation. You got the definition backwards. Within three hours, we got an email back saying, really sorry, we'll change it in the next edition. But that didn't do much. We, you know, we'd already lost that, that case. So then in the fourth department, we lose the case on a totally different ground. The th this is the third court, the third different reason we lose. And that one, they say, you actually can't even bring a writ of habeas corpus. You know why? Because you're asking us not to, to, to release the chimpanzee unconditionally, but to, re but to send him to a sanctuary. And you can't use habeas corpus for that. And we said, oh, yes, you can. And of, of course you can. Um, so they would have us believe that if we had asked them to, to let the chimpanzee out in the middle of Times Square, we would have won the case. Um, something, I don't know what crazy thing, tells me that that's not so. But, but we, we, we lost that one on that ground. Then we filed everything again in Manhattan in the first department. And there, like, the gloves came off. There, when I argued that case in March 2017, it's kind of an intellectual street fight going on in, in, in that courtroom. And they just, first they said, you have to have rights and duties. And we, and, and we said, well, what about children? Come on, don't you have children? Have you ever seen children? And so then they said, well, you know, really, you gotta be human. They said, okay, now we understand. You know, that is so wrong that you have to be human, but at least no one's giving us all the, whatever they're giving us, so all these other things, you're just getting right to the, to the point, which is that only humans can have rights. They don't say why only humans have rights. It's only in half of a sentence do they say that's the reason, but that's, that's the reason. So we appeal that, or we ask the, the court of appeals, which is the high court, as we had done two years before, three years before in, in, the, in, the, in Tommy's case, would you please hear this case further, a further appeal? So they, they only take two or 3% of the appeals. So three years before they had said no. And they're probably gonna say no again, because they only take two or three or four percent of the appeals. So on May 8th, the Court of Appeals said they were not going to take our case, but something really different happened. A single judge who is the first high court judge of any court in the United States to rule on the merits of our case, to give an opinion, said they should have, they should have done that. The chimpanzee is suffering a manifest injustice. Courts cannot continue to ignore this. They are these extraordinary beings. They are not things. And uh, his, his last sentence, he said that there may be reasons why they're not persons. He didn't say they're not persons. He just said they may, there may be reasons why they're not persons, which you clearly thought it said he, you clearly believed he thought they were. But for us, one of the most fulfilling things is that he then showed, he then showed that the Inter the, the appellate courts that had ruled against us, he said, you were all wrong, as, which is exactly what we've been saying. You're all wrong. And he said the idea that you can't have rights because you're human was essentially ridiculous. He said what courts have to do is they have to begin to look at the nature of each species to determine whether or not they should have rights. I mean, I could have written some of this decision. So that's where we are now. Um, we have filed our lawsuit in the state of Connecticut. We filed it in November on behalf of three elephants. That judge, 
he threw us out on standing, but we'll, standing is they, saying that we aren't injured. We'd gotten standing seven times in New York, so we think that will not be a problem in Connecticut. But he also threw us out because we'd filed a frivolous case. And why had we filed a frivolous case? Because no one had ever done it before. So we filed a motion for rehearing saying, we'd like to discuss the issue of frivolous versus novel. And, and the fact that there's about 20,000 common law rules that, we, that you know about, and guess what? Every single one of them was once the subject of the first lawsuit. He, he said, he, he affirmed it, and so up we go. We're now up in the, in the uh, appellate courts of Connecticut. So we then decided to file another one. So um, all of the habeas corpus cases on behalf of prisoners go to one court in Connecticut. We thought, let's file in that court. Um, even though we didn't have the right to do it, we thought maybe they won't notice that we're not in the right court. We don't have venue, that we're not in the right court. Well, we, so we filed that two weeks ago. They did notice, and they then sent us back to the, the, the county that we had come from. And we said, oh no, now they're just gonna send it back to the same judge who threw us out. And, and then two hours ago, we got notice that they had referred the case to a different judge. We said, oh, Okay, let's see what he does. So that's where we are now. Uh, meanwhile, we are now preparing litigation in California. We're likely gonna be filing lawsuits on behalf of elephants, of chimpanzees. You know, we've been telling SeaWorld in public, we're coming after you for your orcas. The problem that we've had is so far there's been no place to put them. There are no orca sanctuaries but that may change in the next year or two or three years. The whale sanctuary project is hard at work. Trying, and Lori Marino, who's, who's one of the people running it, she's gonna be here and you can tell her, I ask you to ask her how it's going. Uh, we've also then brought in, and this will be the last thing I talk about really, we've also brought, brought in a, uh, a campaigns director who is going to start looking at the question of whether or not there are, there are cities that we can try to go in front of the city council in California, especially San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, in which we think they have the right to say that, that say all of the elephants in their city have legal rights. And we think they can do that in California. They can't do it in most other states, but, but they can do that in California. So we're already working on what cities we want to we, we want to go in, what animals are there. And California also allows referendums within cities. So if the city council won't do it, then we're looking at potentially trying to put it in for a vote of the people, you know, San Diego or San Francisco or, or wherever. And if that doesn't work, we're, we're deep into then preparing habeas corpus cases. One thing which, uh, when, I, when I was teaching at Stanford uh, last year, uh, a judge of the, uh, California Supreme Court um, invited me to come to the California Supreme Court to, um, uh, I'll be done in 20 seconds, to give a talk about what the Non-Human Rights Project does. So uh, we think that we might get, you know, some kind of a fair hearing there. Anyway, my time is up, so thank you very much. Say again? Oh. Okay. Well, I'll start off by uh, introducing all of our commenters. So on my left here, we have Mary Lee Jensfold from the Fauna Foundation, who is a primate communication scientist. 
we have Mr. Wise, of course, uh, Nicholas Morello, who is a lawyer and also the co-founder of Droit Animalier Québec. And then to his left, we have Professor Alain Roy, who is a law professor at the University of Montreal. And then on the end, we have Mr. Jonathan Birch, who is from the London School of Economics and who is an assistant professor there. So um, I think first, uh, if anyone has any questions for Mr. Wise. Um, does anyone have any questions? I, I, my, just, my feelings get hurt easily. I just, just want to tell you. Just make sure you come up to the microphone if you have a question. Well, uh, hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I knew that uh, law were very complicated, but this is just a proof of that. Um, it's clear that it's always um, better to change the culture and the way we think than uh, enforcing a law, but I feel like in that case, um, law may be the first step. Uh, I want your opinion about um, animal activists. Do you feel that um, they're helping you reach uh, your goal quickly, quicker? Let me make it clear. We, you know, we, we are just... I'm not sure. I'm not sure for the tip of the spear. Uh, we we come in after the educators and the activists have laid the have laid the groundwork, you know, of years of work, so that so that when people hear what we're saying, they you know they've heard it before, or their 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 attitudes have already tried to change. Um, you don't change any anyone's attitude in a courtroom. Um, you know what you see is what you get, and so uh, we. We rely upon that. We all, however, we also understand that we're both the beneficiaries of activism, and we're also a catalyst of activism, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we we are covered heavily all over the world. <laughs> I, I know last year uh, we, there was we, there were about three thousand articles written about us. So far this year, there's been about a thousand. So, and that then people then read about it and causes them to get involved, which then creates the kind of culture in which we can then do better and then it kind of goes in a loop. Okay, because um, I was talking out of a personal experience. Um, I'm a big animal fans, right? But I met some uh, pretty um, aggressive uh, group of vegan activism and because I didn't get along with them, it kind of changed my opinion a little bit about animals, right? I was more referring to those group who want uh, change to happen too quickly. Uh, Nobody wants change to happen quicker than I. Um, you, you know, in everything you do, you, you have to be strategic. You have to understand what your goal is. You have to understand uh, what, your, what your strategy is going to be. And you have to adjust your tactics um, to that. And if they're not working, you have to be mature enough to set back, step back and say, these aren't working. We need to try these tactics or these tactics or change our strategy or, or even, even change our goal. Um, you know, it's, and I understand it's really easy, and, and I, I spent a lot of time reading about human slavery as well, the history of human slavery. I can only imagine how furious the abolitionists would be, and, and I read about what they wrote. And, you know, I'm furious, the, the kind of the anger is what impel, you know, propels all of us forward, just to, as the judge just said, the manifest injustice, you know, of, of, of what we're doing to non-human animals. And he was referring to a chimpanzee. Uh, so. But, but, but what, what we have to do is, is make sure we channel that in a way that's going to solve the problem rather than just make us feel good. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Wise. Um, first of all, thank you very much for what you do, um, for the struggle you've been uh, leading for the past 30 some years uh, for the animals. And also, I appreciate that you make a connection between slavery, uh, human slavery, and animal slavery. Um, this is something that I noticed a long time ago, and I never heard before anybody say that. So it's really, it's nice to hear. Um, if, if, if I can say, there are some people who get really angry at me for that. They feel that I'm. They say that I diminish human slavery, and I'm saying I'm not diminishing human slavery. Um, if you if you see the film, it it, it, it from two years ago, it, it uh, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2016, and then it's been on it's on HBO since. Um, you can you can watch one judge who I clearly piss off, um, and be, because you know once I don't I don't make the comparison. I just simply cite 
the Somerset case and just citing the Somerset case to her for some other reason is enough to piss her off. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to get into that debate now. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Not yeah, good. but I agree with uh, your view. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the first of all is, the first one is, um, well, I'm wondering on what basis, um, maybe moral basis or legal basis, um, um, do you argue that non-human animals are entitled to personhood, legal uh, uh, person status, or uh, habeas corpus? Is it on the basis that they, you consider animals to be sentient, or just on the basis that they are animals as we are? Uh, and would you apply that to plants and all living beings on the planet? We, we argue right now that, um, <clears throat> probably got lost in all the other stuff I was saying, that um, uh, since the judges value autonomy and they value liberty and they value equality, that we argue in, in, in terms of, of, of all three of those. So we argue that, um, for, for example, I, I didn't talk about the fact that we, we'll, we'll point to cases uh, where you have an adult human being who's in the hospital and she will she will uh, be faced with the, with the problem of uh, if she doesn't get a blood transfusion or she doesn't get surgery or she doesn't take meds, she's going to die. She says, I'd rather die than have, than, you know, than have the surgery. So the hospital then would go to the judges and they'd say, we want you to override her autonomy, her ability to choose what she's going to do and allow us to, to force her to have the surgery. And at least since the early 1980s in the United States, the judges have said, we value her autonomy more than, than we value her life. And we're not going to let you do that. If she wants to die, she can die. So we go to the judges and say, these cases show that you know, how much you value autonomy. Um, however, that's defined. And in the afternoon session, we, uh, we, had, we had a long talk about autonomy. Uh, and uh, it's, it's hard to define, but, but at least, how, and the courts don't help us by, by doing that. So in our cases, we have our expert witnesses define autonomy as they see it from a, from a scientific point of view. So that's our liberty argument. We also argue uh, as a matter of equality that, so we, that, that um, they, so there, there are two things. We actually point to a U.S. Supreme Court case and ask the court to deal to uh, to apply it to the the common law. Um, one of them um, said that uh, you know usually if 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 a court is looking at a statute to try to determine whether it violates equality or equal protection, uh, they they want it to be at least a a um, a rational means to to a um, legitimate end, and. If, if a, a statute that doesn't impinge upon fundamental rights, uh, if, if, it, if it's simply a statute that is a rational means to a legitimate end, they, they will uphold it as a matter of, of equality. And we argue that this, it cannot be a legitimate end for the state to allow the imprisonment of an autonomous being. So we should win not only a matter of liberty, as, but a matter of equality. And then we also cite, uh, cite uh, this uh, US Supreme Court case um, in which it says that you can't point to, you can't strip someone of all their rights because they have a single characteristic. And that characteristic in that case was, was the fact that the, that the guy was gay, or the people were gay. And we say, well, here, our chimpanzee should have the, the right to bodily liberty protected by a writ of habeas corpus. The only reason that she doesn't have it is a single characteristic is that she's a chimpanzee. And we argued that that's, that is, any, is a, an irrelevant characteristic. It's, it's like saying, well, blue-eyed people can have rights, but green-eyed people can't. That, uh, that you're, what, what does your species have to do with anything if you are of the kind of entity who, you know, can, who uh, is, is autonomous and, uh, and which is what the, the writ of habeas corpus you know, exists to protect? So in 45 seconds, that's what our arguments are. Okay, I would have a ton of questions about this and about what is autonomy, and but I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm going to skip. Um, just the other question I had was uh, that you mentioned that um, animals, non-human animals, are considered uh, to be things for the past two two thousand years since the Roman uh, times, and I'm wondering what was it before, if there was any sort of moral or legal status in the Western world about animals before that, or I, I don't know. 
I don't know if there was a Western world maybe yes, before the, yeah. the Greeks and, and the Romans. But, yeah. uh, but when I did research, I went back to Hammurabi's code and, and, and even before that, um, and they, I don't recall them using the word thing, thing or person in there, but clearly, you know, it's many humans are treated differently than, than, but, than, than others. Um, but, and, and also the, um, uh, the civil law system is certainly based pretty closely on, on, on Roman law. And, and we argue to, uh, to a, a relevant extent in, what, in the area we're talking about, a lot of that is based on Roman law too. That, that's why we, we cite it. Again, we try not to make, we try not to tell the judge what we think they ought to do. What we try to do is tell the judges, this is what you already do, and we're just telling you that you need to, to adhere to your principles, and there's no reason why you should not be applying those to our non-human animal client. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we hear more questions from the audience, maybe we can hear from our commentators. We'll have time for uh, more individual questions after, but uh, do any of our commentators have any questions or comments? <laughs> just, uh, just for us to answer the question about uh, not here. Thank you. Um, in the 15th century in France, there were actually trials where uh, farm animals that would go onto the property of another uh, of a farmer uh, were assigned lawyers, and they actually uh, went through a trial process. So the legal system acknowledged that they were or the conception was that they, they were capable of uh, making right and wrong decisions. And then subsequent to the 15th century, that was, uh, that was abandoned because of Descartes and a, for a whole lot of other, other reasons. But there are judgments that are published in France that explain uh, animals that are, are uh, declared responsible or, or, or not. Uh, just um, in terms of Quebec, because we're in a, in a civil law jurisdiction, which means that uh, for, the, for the audience, we don't have judge-made law except in, in federal matters. And so, as you explained very nicely, law for me is based on a system of classification and ticking off the, the, uh, the boxes. So you talked about recategorizing things to, uh, things to persons. And in our law, we have our, our civil code, which is our, our basic legal framework. And then we have a special uh, Animal Welfare and Safety Act. And uh, for over 400 years in Quebec, uh, animals were treated as property. In uh, 2015, uh, the legislator changed this legal status. And so what's interesting in our act is that it specifically says um, that animals are not things. So it says that animals are not things, and then it goes on to say that they are sentient beings and they have biological uh, uh, imperatives. So. Uh, within the legal framework uh, of, of Quebec, this new act, and what I've purported for some time now, is that it really entrenches the principle of moral consideration for, for the animal being, and also establishes the public policy that the legislator, the legislative intent of changing the status from property to a sentient being with biological, uh, biological needs. So I've been listening very carefully to, um, uh, to the research that you've done. And, and in our system, again, the, the, a writ of habeas uh, a corpus, I'm not sure or what your experience is. So my question is, in terms of civil law jurisdictions, uh, have they had any experience with the use of a, a, a writ of habeas corpus? Because one of the problems here would be um, there is there's a legislative framework uh, which would um, deny the the allegation of illegal detention? So. Yes and no. Uh, uh, Argentina uh, uh, has had uh, a, uh, a chimpanzee freed a, a, a after a writ of habeas corpus. Um, there was also uh, an, an orangutan who was, or, who was ordered freed and then not ordered freed and there's been up and down to so many courts I really don't know what, what's going on. Uh, Colombia appears to have a writ of habeas corpus. Uh, Argentina also had something called an amparo, which no matter how many times they explain it to me, I, I don't understand it. Um, uh, but then there, there are other, other places. When, you know, when, when I go there, I ask, 
Do you know what, I, what I'm talking about when I say habeas corpus? And some, sometimes they do, and, and sometimes they don't. Uh, so I, I, I can't really make heads or tails as to you know, why it's a legal history uh, you know, in their jurisdiction, um, which kind of in a broader way, when the non, you know, we're working I think in, in 15 countries now on every continent except Africa. Um, and we never go in and tell people what to do. We go in and say, you know, we don't know anything about your legal system or about the culture or the religion or everything. Uh, we, we're here to just you know, help you with whatever experiences we, we've had that might, might allow you to figure out how to move forward. Because, you know, when, when you say what's going on in Quebec, I think there'd be no reason why I would understand that, that was, you know, everything that's going on in Quebec um, or anywhere else. Uh, you, you know, half the judges say, I don't know what's going on in New York. Um, uh, so they change, but generally, I, I think no matter what they call it, I mean, they, even when they call it a sentient being, I, I have to, I, I don't know how that actually, um, how that actually works on, like on the ground, like are non-human animals, are they, does that mean they're going to be treated, you know, as if they're persons or as if they're things, uh, you know, are or, or, or what, I, you know, so I, I don't really, I don't really know. Uh, we've been writing an article about it for a few years. I'm not the author of it, uh, trying to look at all of these statutes that have passed sentient being statutes, uh, jurisdictions that have passed sentient being statutes to try to understand um, you know, what, you know, are, are they more than rhetorical? You know, are, is there, is, is, do, they, do they make a fundamental change in the lives of the non-human animals who live in that jurisdiction? And in Quebec, I, I mean, I have no idea what the answer is. What, Thank you. what is the answer to that question? Has it affected the the, uh, the the verdict isn't uh, isn't in the law came into effect in December 2015. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Roy uh, was the instigator of the first uh, legal lawsuit around the around the issue, uh, and he he can he can speak to that. And as a result of that lawsuit, the, the Minister of Agriculture, who's responsible for application of the law in Quebec, um, has instituted a, uh, an advisory uh, committee to look at the, the, uh, the issue. And so what will happen is that the advisory committee will make a recommendation to the government. The government will either will do one of two things. They can decide to regulate. They can decide to put into effect a code of practice. They can decide to do nothing. Uh, they can decide to um, ban part of the activities, which are ro rodeos in this, in this question. And, uh, and, and my work with uh, Professor Ra is to really look at, once the government makes that decision, to be able to contest in front of the court the legality of that decision based on the fact that they are not things, that they are sentient beings, that they have biological needs. Uh, and that the government has been misguided. And if I can say one, one of, the, um, of the things that we, we attempt to do, and one of the reasons we, we used habeas corpus, so do you, you, have, stand, do you, do you have standing here in, in Quebec? Uh, Is there, do you have to have standing? Yes. To sue. So one of the reasons we chose habeas corpus is that you, you essentially don't need standing. Um, the reason being is that the injured person is being held against her will in a prison. So the, the legal system has figured out that they won't be able to get to court. So, uh, so a third person can usually come in and, 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 and uh, uh, seek uh, a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of the detained being. Under, in some circumstances not, but in many you can. And so that, that's what we're trying, in, in New York, we for the first time argued, and that's one of the reasons we chose New York, we thought we would win, and we did. Uh, we, so we, we were the first, the people, at least in, in the United States, to be able to get standing, even though we specifically did not allege that we were being injured. We, we alleged that someone, that the non-human animals was being injured. So, so we, we, we were able to get standing there. Um, how? Oui, mais avant, j'aurais quand même voulu intervenir sur la question de, de Nicolas. Thank you, Professor Wise. Oui. There you go. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I will speak French uh, because we're in Quebec and it's important that, that somebody speak French here in UCAM, French University, and Cara uh, will translate. Thank you. Um, 
j'avoue que j'ai un peu les mêmes, euh, les mêmes réflexions que Maître Morello sur l'utilisation de la BS Corpus en droit civil. Euh, on a un article dans la Charte québécoise et dans le Code civil qui définit euh, l'être humain euh, et qui euh, accorde la personnalité juridique aux êtres humains exclusivement. Euh, il y a une cause qui a été rendue par la Cour suprême. Euh, oui, peut-être, mais tu pourrais peut-être traduire l'ensemble ou l'esprit plutôt que chacune des phrases. I'm uh, not by any means a professional translator, so I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> okay, um, go. So essentially, there is an article in the Charter and the Civil Code that defines what a uh, human being is, mm -hmm. if I understood correctly. Oui. Uh, et um, il y a une cause célèbre uh, en 88, 91 plus tôt. In 1990, uh, sorry, in 1988, ouais. there was a, a very famous cause of action. Uh, où on se, se demandait si on pouvait accorder la personnalité juridique à un fœtus. Where we uh, asked, where the court was asked essentially if we could give a legal personhood to a fetus. Et la Cour suprême a dit, uh, je ne peux aller au-delà des termes de la loi. La loi est claire. Un être humain possède la personnalité juridique. Le fœtus n'est pas un être humain, mais une partie intégrante du corps de la femme. So essentially what the Supreme Court said is they said that they were bound uh, by the, the, um, the statutes um, which said that uh, they cannot give legal personhood to a fetus because a fetus is part of a woman's body and that's it. Alors les limites textuelles de nos lois euh, sont plutôt embêtantes euh, et ne donneraient probablement pas le même espace que celui dont vous bénéficiez en commune là. So essentially, because uh, we're, we're bound by these statutes, it's, it makes it difficult for us to, uh, to have the same freedoms as you do in the common law. Et, et la deuxième observation, euh, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un certain paradoxe quand vous dites que euh, la personnalité juridique, ce n'est pas une question biologique, mais une question de, de principes moraux, euh, de politique publique? Uh, il reste que les animaux que vous avez choisis sont des animaux aux capacités cognitives très développées. Um, so, is there a, essentially the question is, is there a paradox? Est-ce que, est que vous pouvez répéter ce qu'il y a là? Que, <rire> un, quand, quand on dit que uh, la question de la personnalité juridique n'est uh, pas une question uh, biologique. So, the question of uh, legal personhood, is it... Is there no, not a paradox by saying that uh, it's um, a biological question rather it, it than... Pas, it's not, it's a, not a bio, question. It's not a biological Mais une question uh, factor, de but, public policy and but a question of public policy, rather. Et de principes moraux. And of moral principle. Alors que les animaux que vous avez choisis uh, sont des animaux qui ont des capacités cognitives très développées, comme However, le chimpanzé, the, the comme The animals that you pick to, to represent are, have very developed cognitive capacities. Like chimpanzees. <laughs> Donc, le facteur biologique a, a une importance. So, the, the biological factor has a certain importance. Parce que ce sont des animaux qui se rapprochent peut-être un peu plus de l'humain. Because they're animals that are closer to humans, essentially. It's not the fact that they're, it's not the fact that they're close to chimpanzees. It's not even their biology. It's the fact that they have the characteristics that the courts say they value. And, uh, and so we were talking about that earlier today, where um, all of a sudden I've been, over the last year or two, I've been finding myself uh, interviewed by the BBC and other places. They want to know, uh, should a robot have rights? Should an algorithm have rights? Um, and my, my, my answer to that is, if they have the qualities, then they should have rights. And the, the, the form in which they are in should be irrelevant. It's the question is, are they, you know, do they have what it takes? And if they do, it doesn't matter if they're a human or a non-human animal or, or, or a robot. Thank you. And, and it wouldn't be, uh, I mean, in the cases with, the, in the cases with elephants and, and cetaceans, I mean, that's, they, they're taxonomically far distant from humans, so. Uh, they, they are, uh, but on the other hand, we, The, the fact that they have qualities that we have and we can identify with is not an accident in the choice of our 
our, our, our plaintiffs because while we don't say that that is a, is a legal argument, we feel that just as human beings psychologically that the judges are more likely to empathize with us if they're faced with a being with whom they empathize, with whose suffering they empathize. Mais dans cette perspective-là, l'argument euh, qu'on invoque devant un juge pour dire qu'une rivière peut avoir la personnalité juridique, qu'une personne morale peut avoir la personnalité juridique. In that perspective, by saying that, by saying things like, for example, a river can have legal personhood or a corporation can have legal personhood, perd beaucoup de sa pertinence. It loses a lot of its pertinence. No. Uh, I think I, I think I understood. Um, Uh, the reason we we argue that uh, that say in in New Zealand a, uh, a river can have you know, can have personhood is that we're doing that to try to kind of keep hitting the judges on the head to, with with the idea to disabuse them of the idea that that persons and humans are synonyms because that's that's really the problem that that, that we have so we try to we try to show every way we can that, that uh, indeed uh, humans you know and, And, and persons are not synonyms. And uh, so we will draw from wherever we can. Oh, I, I know what I wanted to, to finish there. Well, when, I, when the reason I started talking about standing uh, is that the problem that I hear you're running across in the, in the Quebec statute, um, you know, we, we are concerned about, um, about the diminishment of the, of, of the on the ground ability to to benefit from you know rights or which is the problem that crops up with protections now which is that if you don't have a, like a, a hofeldian power right you know if you don't if you don't have a, a right to go in and and sue on your own behalf when you've been injured then it's not clear how well you're actually protected um, which is one of the reasons that's another reason why we chose habeas corpus so that the chimpanzees or the elephants forever, you know, we're arguing they have a right to have us come in and speak on their behalf. And we, and we don't have to go, because if we, you know, we don't have to go to the police, we don't have to go to, you know, the attorney general or the district attorney, because in my experience as an animal protection lawyer, they don't really give much of a damn about what happens to non-human animals. And so one of the reasons that I, that I got into this was realizing that it was really, it, really hard to, to uh, even um, implement the, you know, say the anti-cruelty statutes that were already on, on the book, much less say the Animal Welfare Act at, at, at the federal level, which you know, we, couldn't, we couldn't implement it at all. So we're looking to gain, um, you know, one of the rights we're looking to gain for non-human animals is the power right you know, to have someone go into court on their behalf not necessarily confined to habeas corpus, but more generally, but we're, we're beginning with habeas corpus. Maybe uh, Mr. Birch could address, uh, I was just wondering, the precautionary principle, could it possibly be used as an argument for this, or how would it apply to this type of situation? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say the sentience of the animals is in doubt in these cases. I don't think a serious doubt about the sentience of, of chimpanzees, orcas. Um, and so the particular principle I was talking about yesterday is of very limited relevance here because that's designed to apply to cases like, like crabs and, uh, and, 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 and other such and fish and cases where there's, there's genuine doubt about the sentience of the animals. Um, of course, one could formulate some sort of parallel principle where, where it was about personhood rather than about sentience. Um, that's something I haven't really explored. Um, yeah, so that's all I, all I can say about that, really. I, I, I have thought, I, I have written about this. In fact, I have a little chart in the back of my, on my second book that uses the precautionary principle, not for sentience, but for autonomy. Mm. And so, uh, You know, it's a, so it's really clear that chimpanzees yeah. you know, have autonomy, and then I actually, and and but as you move towards you know other non-human animals, yeah. you move you move to the various mammals or you know apes or in the mammals and amphibians or right. the, that the the argument becomes harder and harder to to show. It's not you can't show yeah. you know, we really don't know anything about them. Um, there's only a few 
non-human animals that we've that we've really studied. You know, there's a million species of animals. A lot of them are beetles, but uh, uh, actually, that's nothing against beetles because I really don't know who they are. Yeah. Um, uh, so they're so most. I'd say the overwhelming number of non-human animals in the world we really don't know anything about, but yet we're using them right now. And and then so I so we I invoke the precautionary principle uh, there yeah. and uh, saying. Uh, you have to decide if if you don't know, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? It's interesting. And yeah, I mean, I can see that the the basic logic of precautionary reasoning the same, could, yeah. could apply here. I mean, if you think there are serious risks of harm resulting from not regarding a particular species and as autonomous as beings persons who is autonomous when they in fact are. That's right. If you can point to that harm, then you have a reason to say as a, as a precautionary measure to mitigate that risk. Uh, there may be some animals we should treat as if, as if they were autonomous while we remain uncertain. Yes. Um, maybe, I mean, maybe chimpanzees are in that category, even. Um, I mean, that's one of the things I was worried, uh, wondering about, right, about what, what autonomy could be such that a chimpanzee could be shown to have it. Right? Um, certainly, I think there are senses of autonomy in which it's pretty doubtful whether humans have it. Um, the, the Kantian sense, for example, where autonomy is supposed to be about genuinely being governed by a law that is outside the laws of nature, but is right. simply the law of a free rational will. Very much doubt human beings are autonomous in that sense. Right. It's a slightly less demanding way of thinking about autonomy where it's about having been capable of acting on desires that you reflectively endorse. And I think maybe humans do have that. But how one would go about showing, sort of convincingly, that the chimpanzees have that, I was wondering about. Yes, go to our website, nonhumanrights.org. We have 160 pages of affidavits from um, eight uh, chimpanzee uh, scientists, and they're all aimed at that Direction. What I think, type of evidence uh, to uh, decide? I'm thinking about uh, uh, there is a, um, a scientist in Sweden. What, what's his name? He actually does look at this specifically at um, at the ability of uh, of say Oswald. Yes, oh, actually, you're. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sitting next to a chimpanzee expert here. So uh, um, uh, allow me at a courtesy to first suggest you might want to answer that, and I'll jump in as well. Well, it's a, I, so. Matthias Oswald. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that, that, that one was in regard to planning. Uh, I think yeah. many of you heard about the chimp that, that planned at the zoo, stored rocks, waiting for the visitors to come. Right. Uh, I think mm -hmm. uh, Bosch did one maybe in regard to culture and, uh, and how they're organized in community. Mine, mine was about sign language. I'm sorry, right, she's, she's, she's one of our affiants. And, um, and then uh, Sue Savage Rumble, I think, did one as well. Yes. Uh, hers also was in regard to language capacity. I mean, the threat lurking here, I suppose, is if you really think reflection is crucial to autonomy, how do you show that? Well, let, let, me, let me say this first about autonomy. Um, mm. I, and I said it in, in, in the afternoon session, is that we have been unable to find any judge who's ever said what autonomy is. Uh, they just yeah. say that humans have it, but they've never said what it is. Uh, so we were so concerned about that that we, you know, we, we had some of our affidavits actually from a scientific point of view saying, Here has, here's how we scientists view autonomy because we we wanted somebody to say something about it because we had to have some standard in case a judge asked that question well what is autonomy we'd say well no thanks to you because you haven't defined it so you know we we say at least from a scientific point of view uh, that's this is what autonomy uh, is mm, well of course it, it's not not a scientific concept well that's, that's, which that's brings me up to the uh, the last um, Judges didn't don't know that. Um, the, what what we uh, did in our in our last brief is actually um, uh, a 
group of 17 philosophers filed an amicus curiae brief yeah. uh, uh, arguing that uh, they'll leave it to us to point out the uh, legal errors, but there was a lot of philosophical errors they thought that the judges were making as well. And they also talked about autonomy from a philosophical point yes. of view. And interestingly enough, uh, the judge in his very favorable decision actually cited the f philosophers talking about autonomy rather than our scientists who are talking about autonomy. I agree, that's very good. It's very good to have that affidavit and philosophers as well. I suppose the, the worry in the background for mm -hmm. me is this thought that arguments based on autonomy could be quite limited in scope, right? That even if the case for chimpanzees is, is made <laughs> and is convincing, very, very hard to extend that beyond chimpanzees. Well, we, we think at least all four species of great apes, we, we don't think we have any problems showing that they're, they're autonomous. Uh, we've, are, we've already filed our lawsuits on behalf of uh, both Asian and African elephants. We think we don't have any problem there. We think we will not have a problem with, with orcas um, either. Um, but, you know, with, it's, it's kind of seamless within the you know, animal kingdom that uh, uh, things, will, you know, it'll get harder and harder to prove autonomy. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we argue that autonomy is a sufficient but not a necessary condition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're hoping that enough cases come down where judges recognize that autonomous beings have have certain kinds of rights that protect their autonomy. Then they'll kind of get used to that idea. And and I'm and I'm not being uh, I, I, I'm I'm not joking at all. That one of the in in some fundamental way that's what we're really trying to do to get judges used to the just the very idea that a non-human animal could have rights. And once they start doing that, um, I think it's then kind of easier to um, to then uh, make other arguments that are not based on autonomy, but might be based on some other, uh, some different cognitive capacity. Mm -hmm. Although, and there may be some eventually that aren't even based on cognitive capacities at all. I, I could imagine those. Um, and some people, for example, um, have, have argued to us, and I thought about it and, and rejected it, but one day I'm, we will come back to it. Uh, we should have started with dogs and cats, you know, not because they're autonomous or have any great cognitive abilities, although my dog happens to be the smartest dog in the world. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's because humans already have that. And indeed, some of the judges have talked about how much we love yeah. our dogs and cats, and because of that reason, maybe chimpanzees should have rights. Um, mm. I, I, I didn't feel comfortable making that argument because I couldn't find any scientific grounding for it. And I think scientific grounding is also a, a, is a necessary condition for winning, but it's not sufficient. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I didn't think we didn't have the science, at least at this point, for, for, for showing a really complex cognitive uh, ability. Uh, for example, there. Uh, I'm, we, uh, dogs uh, and cats don't pass the mirror self-recognition test right now. Um, but that probably for dogs is because they haven't devised one that uses smell, you know, other than, you know, other, other than sight. So we can't really prove that they're self-conscious while, while other animals, you know, have. And also if we can prove that, that the non, our non-human animal client has a, has a theory of mind, which, which I think chimpanzees or you know, apes do have a theory of mind, um, I'm not sure how complex it is, but I think I think one exists. I think that that really helps, you know, in, in, as well. So um, so we start with this kind of scientific, you know, st strict scientific basis, but then we have to mix in all the fuzzy stuff too, because um, we have to make the judge want to rule in our favor. It's really, you know, you know law is, it's you know, it's not. It's not sterile. It's not. It, it it may look like that to people who aren't lawyers, but you know, underneath the sterile writing, there's all kinds of stuff, you know, pulsating that leads the judge, you know, to to. It's kind of it's come advocacy, out. right? It's uh, well, the, it's, the judge has to want an to do it. Element, and, yeah. and 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 I firmly believe that what when a judge wants to do it, it'll be done, no matter what the evidence is, no matter what the arguments are. They'll find a way to get the case to come out the way they want it to come out. I'm not saying that. Even Lord Mansfield once said that that the cases were too strong. He he just couldn't rule in a certain way. But I think that's pretty rare. I uh, I, I think that uh, judges who really want to rule in our favor are going to rule in our favor, and judges who really don't, you know, really aren't. 
which brings me back to my, my, my talking about the fact that animal activism, you know, good animal activism, you know, is what causes them to, you know, want to rule in our favor, or at the least listen to us, you know, with as fair, as, as much as, you know, as much fairness as they can. Though, you know, we're also, I wrote a law review article in which I talked about not only um, saying that I believe that because our culture is so biased about, uh, against what, what, what we're doing, because we're all raised in it, that almost every judge has an implicit bias against what we are doing. Um, in the interests of your clients, uh, let's let the okay. interviewers say more. And occasionally, by the way, an explicit bias. <laughs> Maybe we can take a question from over there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Weiss, for your fantastic presentation. Uh, I have, well, I had something to say about the, I wanted to talk about the autonomy uh, um, argument as well, uh, but since it was discussed, maybe I just <laughs> want to say that my, well, my question was, you explained very clearly that common, in common law, judges, judges make the law. So I'm, I'm wondering, even if they, um, if they uh, decide in your favor, the argument to use the reasons why they did uh, would be become the, the 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 official criteria. So I'm I'm a bit worried about the other animals that might not be as autonomous as <laughs> even if you talk about practical autonomy, it's still uh, maybe more difficult to reach for other uh, species of animals. And I I, I I feel as if you might take the risk of uh, getting a judgment where it's because they are autonomous that they get the personhood status. And, but my real question was more about uh, David Favor, Favor you talked David, about, yes. that you uh, worked with um, at the beginning uh, of the, the Non-Human Rights Project. I don't know if you still collaborate with him uh, very closely. I, I don't, but we're good friends. We just you know, yeah. spoke the other day. Then maybe you can tell, explain to me what you, th explain what, uh, or tell what you talk, think about uh, his view on the property, properties that can have rights. And is uh, in his uh, paper, uh, Living Property, if I understood correctly, he believes he, uh, he, he thinks that he explains that it's not this div division between persons and things is not th at that dec decisive to get uh, to be the subject of free, free legal rights. Um, I I'll try to do it really briefly. He's a much better person to talk about it, his uh, you know his theories than than I. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, le let me talk uh, about the fact that I, I think we're actually talking about things that are very closely related. Uh, I think D David talks about, um, uh, I can't remember the exact words, um, <clears throat> living property, living property, and, um, and says that you can be property and still have certain rights. And I mean, I entirely agree with him. Um, uh, I think it's I don't think it makes any sense, but I, I don't. I don't think it contra It conflicts with with what I argue. What I argue is what, once you're a person, then you have the capacity for, you know, one or an infinite number of, of rights. So uh, I, I could see why why someone for, say you might have a non-human animal have the right not to be um, uh, detained against her will, but yet you'd still be property. Or you might you, you might have all kinds of rights. But you would still be property, or you could even eat into the property rights. You know, you could say you could be uh, you could be bought, but you couldn't be sold. I mean, I, I, I don't have any idea. But but um, uh, once once you are a person, and I, I, I don't, and I, I think he would have to agree that if you have any rights by definition, you are a person. He just he think he thinks more than I that there's no way that we're going to get rid of the property status of non-human animals. You need to work to try to get other ways of, of helping them. But I think, uh, I think that the property status of non-human animals is, is going to crumble soon. And, and I think even, th even through habeas corpus, you know, once non-human animals are, are seen as ha having a right of habeas corpus, I, I think that it's not likely that, that their property status is going to continue on very long. One real quick thing is that I want to emphasize, and I know that the arguments we make about autonomy is that we can only argue that autonomy is a sufficient but not a necessary condition. That does not mean that the judges are either going to misunderstand or twist what we're saying, uh, because that, that happens. And so it would not shock me if it happened just as you're saying. But 
anything can happen in the courtroom. And if you if and uh, you either you either decide that you're going to start fighting or or you're not. And so once you start fighting, then then the fight goes on and on. And if you get and if you lose, then you just get back in and you, and you just keep fighting. Uh, persistence, which is our strong suit, um, really is you know, eighty percent of as Woody Allen said, eighty percent of life is just showing up, and that's. And we feel, you know, 80% of being able to gain legal rights for non-human animals is, is being positive that you're right, you know, as a matter of history, as a matter of morals, you know, as a matter of law, and simply being refused to be discouraged. And you just go back again and again and again and view it as an education of the judges, which is what we do. Before we take another question, um, I, when you were talking about living property, the th concept of living property, it sounds like kind of uh, what we have in Quebec right now under the civil code. I don't know if Mr. Morello or Mr. Hua wants to address that. Yeah, I'm not sure about, about qualifying. In our civil code, we have one sentence that says animals are not things. So that's very, very clear. Then it says they're sentient beings, and it says that they have biological imperatives. Then there's a, a second part of the paragraph that says that the dispositions with respect to property apply, nevertheless. So it's it's at, at first sight it took it took me um, many many months of trying to understand what was the legislative intent behind that. I don't believe that the legislative intent is that. Um, animal beings in Quebec are, are living property. I believe that when the legislator changed the status of animals to what we call animal beings, because there are human beings and animal beings, when animals became hu animal beings, sentient beings, there was a need for a legislative framework to be able to continue for the legal system to work. So they had to put in a section about, about uh, property applying just the same. So for instance, if you say that um, a dog is a sentient being and it has biological imperatives, and the, the law also says that you have to provide socialization, uh, environmental enrichment for the, for the, for the dog, etc., cetera, um, you still have to understand who, who owns the dog. If you tried to take, if I tried to take your dog, what, right, what cause of action do you have to say, no, that belongs to me? So that, so, in terms of the, the law, there's a legal framework that says that animal beings are sentient, but then there's this disposition that says that pr uh, dispositions or property still apply. And the verdict is unclear. What does that mean exactly? I don't think that that means that it's qualified as living property, but I don't know, Professor Roy. Oui, je suis d'accord avec cette interprétation-là, mais... in agreement with that interpretation? Je me demande si la, la définition qu'on a maintenant en droit québécois de l'animal comme un être sensible But qui a des impératifs définition that we have right now of an animal uh, that has biological needs ne pourrait pas uh, constituer l'équivalent de votre cours en habeas corpus couldn't be um, something like the equivalent of uh, the habeas corpus parce que on peut prétendre qu'il est contre les impératifs biologiques d'un chimpanzé d'être gardé en captivité. Because we can, we could argue that it is against the biological needs of uh, a chimpanzee to be imprisoned. So would it, essentially, would it be something similar or a, a, a analogous remedy in some ways? Alors, à l'intérieur du texte de la loi, qui est la barrière du droit civil. So within the, the text of the law, which is what civil law is made of. On a peut-être euh, la possibilité d'obtenir un résultat similaire à celui que vous recherchez par le mécanisme de l'ABS corpus. We may have a, a similar way to reach the same, or a similar result um, within the text of the law, in civil law, as you do in common law, potentially. <laughs> You might, if you haven't, you might want to read the the Argentinian case, the Argentinian civil law mm. habeas corpus case, um, which for me was an example. If a judge wants to get to a place, that's you know she'll, she'll get there. Uh, talking about uh, talking about environmental statutes really was the way that 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 she used to. 
to uh, um, get to where she wanted, that, that the uh, chimpanzee uh, was entitled to writ of habeas corpus. Mais je ne connais pas la loi argentine, sauf que parfois, il y a quand même une marge d'interprétation que le texte euh, autorise. Je ne sais pas si il ne connaît pas l'ordre argentin, mais parfois, il y a une marge d'interprétation que la loi permet. Alors que nous, However, on a une définition de la personnalité juridique. Pour nous, dans notre loi, nous avons une set de définition de ce qu'est la personnalité juridique. Ce qu'on n'avait pas, qu avant 1994 et yeah. ce qu'on n'avait pas avant yeah. 1977 dans la charte. Donc, Which we didn't have before uh, 1994 and before the charter. So it was introduced in these, in these texts. I, 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 we, we have, have some more sorts of issues um, in the United States. Um, it, it, one, one of the reasons we don't litigate on the federal level is because We don't, we don't think we have any chance of winning on the, on the federal level because we probably have similar problems as you do because there's really no common law. There's no federal common law. So we have the same similar kinds of problems. Um, but we have 49 common law states. Louisiana you know, is not. And, um, uh, but even they are on a, on a wide range. There, there are certain states that we're, we're not going into. We're, um, basically, The ones who seceded in 1860 were not going. Were, they don't do too hot with uh, non-human animals, you know, either. The conf old Confederate states, um, they're not that hot with human rights. Um, and so we have a rule of thumb that if you're not that hot with human rights, you're not going to be that hot with non-human non rights. So those courts we don't even consider. Um, well, we'd have the same problem you did. That's why, you know, I, I live in Florida. There's a orca named Lolita in my, you know, not far from where I live that, We've just thought, how can we file a, a you know lawsuit in Florida? And the answer is, we just we just don't think we, we can. It's just uh, it's just going to be impossible for us to do it. Maybe we can take another question from the audience. Mm. Um, this is a really interesting discussion. Um, what is the response of a non-human project to? Um, invasive species or surpopula surpopulation um, if we consider the individuals of those species as legal person. I was talking to a, a hunter not so, uh, not so, uh, so long ago and he was justifying his activity with uh, this argument even if it's some kind of a false dilemma Uh, there's still some practical issues that are relevant in it. I found, I know, uh, by example, that we have a problem with uh, Virginia deer uh, right now uh, on the South Shore, for example. So I just wonder, what do we do with surpopulation or invasive species? Um, well, it's... First thing, if, if you are if you're if you're a person that has a right to bodily liberty, then you have a right to bodily liberty, and uh, uh, we we also say that uh, the kind of rights you have is the kind of is, while it's a, you know a chimpanzee rights, chimpanzees have chimpanzee rights, and you know, and uh, elephants have elephant rights, humans have human rights. We're not talking about giving them human rights, but they're but they are entitled to rights that that are analogous to to uh, humans. So. Uh, basically, you, you stop treating non-human animals differently than human beings. Human beings aren't any aren't, aren't aren't to be set aside. So, if he wants to start shooting invasive species, they're like you know next door. Uh, but I don't think he's going to do it. That's what I would ask him. You're not you don't have a problem with invasive species, or else you'd be you know shooting your wife. Uh, you 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 simply want to you don't know, like other invasive species. Well, maybe they don't like you. So it's just, it's, I think as Robert Nozick said, it's like deontology for humans and utilitarianism for animals. And that's what we're trying to, to stop. It's deontology, it's rights for, it's rights for everybody. Um, and, and so that, that's the first thing. I, I don't, I, I think that argument is just plain speciesist, arbitrary argument. It's been used before to justify all kinds of, of uh, uh, violence and exploitation against human beings as well. 
Um, however, there is a real problem sometimes because uh, the humans have really altered the environment uh, and taken away natural predators, um, uh, so things get out of whack. But at least in the United States, there's you know there's a go no go. There's either the problem if there's a problem you go out and shoot them. Um, but if, if they become rights bearers, you're going to have to think a lot harder as to how you're going to solve this problem because you can't go around shooting rights bearers uh, if, if they have the right against being shot. And so you're, gonna, you're just going to have to spend more money and more time trying to um, think of what, how you're going to deal with, with the problem. And, um, and, and there's some that are just, it's horrible. You, know, you, you just can't, it, it's horrible to, to figure out how you're going to deal with them. You know, when I was in South Africa, uh, you're looking at the at elephants now who've been put in such a small space that they they basically pick it clean, and not and then not only would they die, but all the other animals would die. And the, and uh, and the question is, do you shoot the elephants? Um, uh, you know, I can't I can't agree that you shoot the elephants. Uh, there has to be other ways of doing that. And one way is that human beings have to stop taking up all the space and all the rights, and they have and they just can no longer do what they want with respect to non-human animals. They may have to start giving some of it back. And not only, it's not that they would like to get something back, but that non-human animals should have the right, perhaps, to demand that they get some of it back. Or, you know, people like me or the professors on, on their behalf demand, you know, one of their rights is to be able to have a habitat, a suitable habitat. It's not that they're, we're giving it to them because it's out of the goodness of our heart. They have a legal right to it, and by golly, they're going to get it. Thank you. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so probably time for a few more questions, maybe over here. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, just looking into the future a little bit, I, I know that you will uh, win your, your cases, and uh, just humankind, I think, just has to catch up to you a bit. Um, how do you think, if any, effect would this have on factory farming? Uh, or is that your next uh, battle, if you could speak to this a bit? Well, right now we're not litigating animals, cases involving animals that are uh, used for food. Uh, another reason we chose chim chimpanzees, elephants, for example, you may notice um, they're non-indigenous to, to the United States. There are very few of them. There's very little e economic value. Uh, you know, we do that on, you know, that's, that's one of the many reasons we, we chose them. And they're also extraordinarily co cognitively complex. Um, there's all kinds of political and legal and scientific reasons why we would choose them. But we decided, you know, not to pick a fight with the, you know, with the big ag business, you know, the first time around, or maybe even the 10th time around. Um, uh, and also, uh, we think judges, um, uh, every judge we go in front of, you know, would be eating our client, uh, which, which is, a, a, is even a bigger problem. Uh, so uh, we'd, rather, we'd rather rely upon their, their empathy with chimpanzees or their, their empathy with orcas, maybe their empathy with elephants, rather than thinking, you know, I'm not going to be able to eat, you know, eat these animals anymore. Um, in fact, the other side would tend to argue that um, the the other side would would will say uh, if you give the chimpanzee rights, and you know, pretty soon we're all going to have to be vegans. Um, and in court, we um, deny that. We say, uh, and I, actually, um, it's 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 a slippery slope argument, and that's really the best argument. Uh, that the other side has because it appeals to all kinds of ignorance um, and they make the slip they've made the slippery slope argument if you give if you give this right to chimpanzees then you know we're all going to be you know vegans next um, and uh, the one judge who addressed it I thought did it just the way that a really good judge should, should do it certainly a really good common law judge would do it in a footnote she noted the argument and she said that if the party before her you know, has a right that's being violated, she will provide a remedy. And you have to wait for the next case to see whether the party before 
that judge is also being denied a right. So she rejected the use of the slippery slope argument specifically in the context you know, of a right for a non-human animal. We can take a question from over there. Given that um, pretty much, I'm assuming all judges were once law students and a growing number of law students are schooled in animal law, doesn't the future look bright for breaking that 2,000 year old precedent? precedent? Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I, I think, I, I know that every judge we go in front of now, that uh, I know that none of them have ever taken an animal law class. Uh, and um, Let's see, some of my students should be starting to get to be judges. <laughs> I remember when I talked to Harvard, I said, any of you are gonna be judges, remember this day, and when they wheel me into the courtroom you know, to make the, to make the argument that non-human animals have rights, remember this, this day and this, this class. So uh, I, I think to some degree, we are where the environmental movement was some years ago, because uh, at one point, no judges had ever taken any environmental law classes. They didn't understand it at all. And now, uh, they, many of them have taken environmental classes, and law schools have, have uh, clinics, um, and also they have, uh, they have courses just for judges on, on environmental law. Um, I was just at the Tel Aviv Law School, and uh, they had a environmental law clinic. And last year, they, turned, they changed it to the Environmental Law and Animal Rights Clinic. Uh, and, and the animal rights part is actually uh, based on the work of the Non-Human Rights Project. In fact, they asked me to come back and teach, teach there for a month about, about the work of the Non-Human Rights Project. So you know, those, those people and all the people who are taking it, all the hundreds and hundreds of students who are being churned out, are going to be more open to the idea. You know, we've always thought you know, from, you know, from the beginning that a judge is gonna have to hear this five times or 10 times or 20 times or, what, or whatever. Uh, before, you know, most judges uh, are going to have to hear it a lot, but not just in the courtroom. That's why I can't, I can't emphasize too much the, the, the work that animal activism does, to have them hear about it, you know, all the time. Um, you know, they, they, they want to know, at least my personal belief, is judges don't get too far ahead of the people, and they don't get too far behind of the people. The people. So they, they want to know that, that they're doing a good thing and they're, and, and they're doing the right thing. Um, I, I, I had a talk uh, with that California Supreme Court justice who invited me to come speak at the California Supreme Court. And I said, the our kind of arguments we make are geared And I see with uh, younger people, uh, there, there is generally speaking, I think, little interest in the legal community, at least in Quebec, uh, with people that have practiced uh, law for 30 years, 20, 30 years. There's little interest, but there's a great interest among law students. And there's also hope. Uh, one case that comes to mind uh, was a recent Supreme Court decision in Canada uh, where the accused was charged with bestiality and the issue was whether or not uh, the animal, that the person had to have um, intercourse with the animal to be found guilty of bestiality. And the, there was a, there's a, a Animal Justice Canada, which is a nonprofit, uh, filed a motion to intervene to be able to speak to the court about the impact on the, on the animal being. So that's very significant because what was that issue was, was this person guilty of bestiality, which is an infraction under the criminal code? The Supreme Court didn't um, give reasons to why they, would, they allowed the nonprofit to intervene and to give the court the view of the, of the animal being, but they allowed it. And so it's, it's, I think it's those kinds of, of, of movement through uh, Mr. Wise, through, through, through your good work, 
when you talk about educating judges that gets the judiciary thinking about these issues and open to listening to arguments. So I'm, I'm encouraged with all of the energy that you have devoted to move law forward. You know, even, even in Connecticut now, although it didn't seem to affect the first judge we, we went in front of, but we're hoping it affects other judges, there's, there's a new statute that, um, that says whenever an animal's interest is affected in a courtroom proceeding, the judge has the ability to appoint a guardian ad litem to represent her interest in court, which is, so she doesn't have the right to it, but the judge has the discretion to do it. Um, that, and that's, I hope, on the road to one day, the judge having the right, right to do it. So it, it's coming in, from, it's coming in from, from a lot of places, and pretty soon you have a public policy. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Both? Okay. Okay. We have time for two more questions. talk and for the fight. Uh, what I was wondering is if the general public is ready to recognize uh, non-human animals as uh, legal persons. In the case of uh, Leo and Hercules, when you're reading online um, articles, I noticed in the comments that a lot of people focused too much on the word uh, person, ignoring the uh, legal uh, aspect of it although I know that there are non-human uh, legal persons. So what I wanted to know is, does the general public opinion affect the judge ruling, or if the ruling is solely based on uh, judicial and legal um, arguments? Oh, you get it. Oh, uh, whatever, I don't care what the judge says, he or she's affected by public opinion. Uh, only the most unusual judge will be able to do that. Lord Mansfield, by the way, I think may have been that one, one of those judges who might not have given a damn what, it, what anyone thinks about, about him. But, but most, most judges want to feel that they're doing the right thing and that people believe that, they're dead, that, she, that she, she's doing the right thing. Um, the word person, we have found in experience, is problematic, um, not only inside the courtroom with the judge, but outside, outside the courtroom. And we have, um, we have begun talking in terms of uh, of uh, the the non-human animals just having rights because you're, you're if you have rights then you you are a person. So we have seen, for example, in fact, in in the film, I I, I look at a Gallup poll which shows that 30 percent of Americans in the Gallup poll said that an, said that animals should have the same rights as human beings. Uh, I mean, I would I would said it have said no. Um, so and that was 40 percent of American women and 20 percent of American men said that. Um, we're now working with pollsters at, at, at uh, Fordham University, and their data coming out is, 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 is at around 50 percent uh, right, right now. Um, not, if we asked, should they be persons, I'm with you, I think probably the, uh, it would go down a lot. But when you ask, uh, should animals have either the same rights as, as humans, or should they have you know, fundamental rights at all? Um, that seems to be be climbing higher, and I think we may, you know, we may have hit 50% in in the United States. Now, again, that's theoretical. Um, I'm not all that sure when they're when they're faced with the, you know a specific animal. You know, sometimes when I talk, I say that we, we never talk about animal rights in the in the non human rights non human rights project, and there's two reasons: it's animal and it's rights. And there's a million species of animals, and the rights that that a, you know that a chipmunk should have and a chimpanzee should have you know don't may, may not have anything to do with, with with each other and also the kind of right you should have what well, has to be geared to the kind of being you are so there's no such thing as saying well should animals have rights it, to me it, it's almost a non nonsensical question should a chimpanzee have a right to bodily liberty protected by a writ of habeas corpus you know yes thank you Okay, uh, my name is Catherine Herman. I'm actually from Germany, and I used to be a state inspector for animal research. And um, this way, I learned how difficult it is, it is to persuade judges. So I wasn't very successful with that. And um, so I'm wondering if you or your team also offer training for people, for scientists or veterinarians who represent uh, animals in court. Because as you said earlier this afternoon, you have to speak their language, otherwise they don't understand what, what, what your point is. 
I've never thought of that until you just said it. Uh, now I'm thinking about it. Yeah, it's and very I'll important because otherwise we don't get anywhere. Like you, I was, I had cases where it was obvious that the scientists um, <coughs> like didn't follow the rules, the, the legal rules, and I still lost. Like the judge would still say that's minor or that's yeah we close the case or we don't even discuss. And I was kind of shocked because you have the law, but then you try to enforce the law and then you get nowhere. And were, were you doing that as a public official or as a private um, attorney? As a state uh, veterinarian, so. Yes, yes. Well, the, and that's the problem that I, that I see sometimes. Um, you know, when that state actors, although it's not the, the exact same problem, but um, sometimes judges just don't obey the law. I mean, it happens to us all the time. And then you have to figure out what you're going to do. We, the only, I think the thing that worries me about training is that assumes that we know what we're doing. And um, I, we're, we're still, we're only four years into this. And, you know, we, we learn every, every single time we file a lawsuit. Um, we, we say, oh, we, we never thought of that. Or who would have thought the judge would say this? Or who would have just thought the judge would say that? Um, but um, we also, I think, realize that we've accumulated an immense amount of experience. So I think I, I will bring that back to my lawyers and, and talk about whether they think we can offer some kind of training, maybe even online training. Yeah. Um, um, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I just want to thank our speaker, Mr. Wise, and all of our commentators. Thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you so much.